This is Michael Popak, and you know it's time for Legal AF After Dark. Sometimes somebody can do a, a, a tremendously bad thing in a civil case and go to jail. You, you in a civil case can screw up so badly that you've now committed a crime. See, as an example, Alan Weisselberg, disgraced former chief financial officer for Donald Trump, who participated in the very case uh, matter that starts next week in the criminal court in Manhattan, the Stormy Daniels hush money cover up election interference case. But he has his own problems because he perjured himself and lied under oath to the New York attorney general in the civil fraud case against Donald Trump on behalf of Donald Trump when he said, I, I, I don't know how they miscalculated the size of the triplex in Trump Tower and called it 30,000 square feet instead of 10,000 square feet, except he actually didn't know exactly how they did it because he did it. And we talk about it on Legal AF. Take a listen. Well, now we got to talk about Alan Weisselberg again who is apparently on parole, not probation. Karen will talk about that. Um, Alan Weisselberg, two ways. We'll talk about him with the New York Attorney General matter and the bond issue um, and, and the case uh, that keeps on giving um, even after judgment of the New York Attorney General um, civil fraud for $165 million plus running with 9% compounded interest uh, annually uh, against Donald Trump. Alan Weisselberg finds himself and a sticky wicket once again, notwithstanding the fact he's now sitting in Rikers Island, um, uh, having been convicted a second time for, for perjury, uh, while the Manhattan DA did him a solid and let him plead guilty to um, counts not related to him lying under oath in the courtroom of Judge Angoran. He did lie under oath in the courtroom of Judge Angoran um, because he said the exact same thing there that he told um, the Manhattan DA, uh, sorry, the New York Attorney General during their investigation and deposition of him. Uh, and now the, the judge wants to get to the bottom with, Man uh, with the uh, New York Attorney General fast on their trail about how did that happen, that he testified falsely in front of this bench trial, the judge presiding over the trial with no jury on these key issues where he threw up his hands and said, I really don't know where they came up with that wrong estimate of the square footage of the triplex apartment Trump Tower. I really have no idea. To which Forbes magazine, and we'll try to find the clip, Forbes magazine ran in real time while he testified. Uh, Alan Weisberg just committed perjury <laughs> because he gave an interview in the apartment and he waved his arms around. He said, look, 10,000 square foot of floor, three floors, triplex, 30,000, except he was it was 3,000, uh, 3,300 square feet of floor for three floors for 10,000. And that made um, the tr valuation of Trump Tower instead of 50 million on the books and records of Donald Trump and on his financial statement, 150 million. And that's a problem. And it's a problem for the lawyers too, because Chris Keis, Alina Haba, Cliff Robert all represented both Alan Weisselberg and Donald Trump. I mean, that's another example of why of bad lawyering, you know, get your lawyer, get your clients different lawyers. Uh, for this kind of same reason. And then you won't be facing questions like, did you know that your client had committed perjury when he did and the documents that he used and all of that? And why weren't those documents produced? And, they, and then now they're going to have to ask, answer all of these questions. So we got that going on. And, and then before I turn it over to KFA, we got the bond issue, which is, you know, we thought, oh, okay, you know, he got a, he got a break from the first, appellate, the first Department Appellate Division. They lowered his bond to $175 million because he told him he couldn't find a bond for hire, uh, which is not true. <laughs> and um, we said, oh, crap, they lowered it. Now he's going to post it. He's got enough cash. And he, he went bragging around town. I got the cash. I'll post it. And we thought, well, maybe he'll just post the cash and he won't have to deal with bonding companies. But no, he was already in discussions with Don Henke, who is a Trump supporter, Trump donor, and he's the king of the subprime auto loan. He's the guy you go to when you have no or low credit. Hence, Donald Trump finding Don Henke. And Don Henke, unlike a publicly traded surety company that is usually what you use for bonds uh, at this at this level, he just, you know, he does his own due diligence, his own underwriting, which means no underwriting. He said, oh, Donald Trump seems like a good credit risk. I'll give him the $175 million bond as long as he backs it with stuff, you know, real estate or cash or whatever it was. Although he doesn't know now where the cash came from or who it came from, which is a problem under anti-money laundering and Bank Secrecy Act laws and Patriot Act laws. You're supposed to know your customer and know where you get your money from. Uh, and then he filed this piece of paper that people that practice in New York were like, hmm, 
there seems to be a problem with this. Where is the financials that they're supposed to post along with it and tell the court that they have the wherewithal to back the 175 million? Uh, and then they posted the financials a day later, and that was no better because the financials showed they were underwater. They didn't have enough surplus in order to post to, to make good on the bond should there be a problem. And while they keep screwing around with the bond, the attorney general said, I have a right as the person you're trying to post the bond against. I can call the bond or have the bond proven. We'll prove the bond in a proceeding, in an evidentiary hearing, and everybody can come in. Don Hankey can come in and his president can come in and, and they can talk about the assets that are backing the bond and why um, and why Don Hankey uh, didn't find out where the cash is coming from. So this is going to be like blown up. We'll be able to cover it on Legal AF and on the Midas Dutch Network, which will be great, um, that particular hearing. So the judge is very concerned. So the bond has currently not been accepted. Now, in the meantime, Letitia James can't yet, yet go and collect yet. But if that bond gets rejected at that hearing, which will be in the next week or so, I think it's a week after next, then um, she can start collecting. She can go with the sheriff and levy against uh, bank accounts of Donald Trump, and she knows where they are through the through the uh, Barbara Jones, the monitor, who's the former federal judge who sits over all of Donald Trump's assets with these superpowers. She can go start sucking money out of bank accounts, like all the cash that he has that he that he brags about. She can do lots of other things. If that bond fails, and Donald Trump's people, and I don't think they are. If they don't have a plan B, which is like post the cash, 175 million plus in cash, she's going to start just going to the bank and, and and not on the 175. That was the bond amount. Start collecting on her 465 plus running interest. So Karen, you followed also what happened with uh, the Weisselberg perjury and now the bond amount. And what what's your takeaway about what's going to happen next in those proceedings? So the Weisselberg, look, that that was just a <clears throat> a sentencing today. It was a few seconds long. It was an agreed upon sentence. He, that's why he didn't say anything. And he came to court dressed to go to right back to Rikers in his sweats. You know, he didn't come in a suit. Um, and that's the way these agreed upon sentences are. They're just very pro forma. You literally show up and bring your toothbrush, as they say. And the judge says, you know, are you ready to be sentenced? He says, yes. Is there anything you have to say? He says, no. And he he goes to serve his time. And this is the second time he's done it, right? So he he's a pro at this. He knows what it's like to be at Rikers. And he has clearly made the calculation uh, in his mind that he can do that. And it's not that big of a deal for him. Certainly not worth having to uh, testify against his old boss, Donald Trump. And that's clearly the calculation. He'd rather do time for Trump than uh, than not. And so as a result, the prosecution is never going to call him as a witness. Look, they threw him a break, as you pointed out. Um, and they didn't make him plead guilty to the perjury in court that he did because that would have impacted the fact that he was on what's now called post-release supervision, which is um, the, the newer term for parole, which is an older term in New York. And it's this post-release, it's a supervision period that happens after you are released from prison and and, and they, they monitor you and you have to check in and, and drug test and those sorts of, sorts of things. And if you violate it by committing another crime, you can be put back in and to have to serve much more time. And I guess they didn't want to make him do that. He's uh, elderly and they, I think, made the calculation that, look, he committed perjury and so we're going to let him plead guilty to the time that he lied when he uh, during the deposition, which was predated his um, his sentencing in uh, the tax case. So that way it doesn't trigger this violation of post-release supervision because you didn't commit a crime while you were out. Certainly you weren't convicted of a crime while you were out. So and it's very common to let a defendant who's charged with multiple counts to plead guilty to some and not all of the counts as part of a plea deal. They probably decided to uh, do it because they obviously have bigger fish to fry right now than uh, go after Alan Weisselberg yet again for what? For more time. Um, so they just, they, they entered into this agreement and they're not going to call him as a witness. Uh, he's useless as a witness. This is a trial against Donald Trump. He's not going to talk about Donald Trump. He's not going to say anything that hurts Donald Trump. And now he's lied under oath. Uh, 
Once you've, once you've committed perjury now, right? Now that you are currently here, uh, I think that's a tricky, you know, if, if this isn't like in your past or a long time ago or before you've changed, you know, there's, there's no kind of, um, way of coming to grips with the fact that just a few short months ago you committed perjury. That makes you kind of, uh, tricky and, and not worth that much as a witness for the Manhattan DA's office. So I think that's why they're not going to call him. Plus, what's he going to say if he's not going to talk about Trump, right? There's, there's just no reason to call him as a witness. So he's going into Rikers. Um, of course, uh, they could call him as a witness, and so could Donald Trump, but he'll be coming in from the back to testify, not through the front. Um, what they would do if, he, they, if Donald Trump or, or the government or the prosecution called him as a witness, he'd be woken up at three o'clock in the morning, put on a bus in Rikers Island. He'd be driven to court. Uh, he'd be given a suit by somebody who would bring it to for him. He'd probably change into a suit in the back and then he'd come out the back door. He'd come through the back door into the straight into the courtroom and he would testify. And then he'd go back the same way as opposed to coming in through through the front where witnesses who are at liberty come from. So, so that's the Weisselberg thing that I think they were hoping um, that he would flip on Trump and uh, and tell tell all, but he didn't. And instead, he decided to take a bullet, another bullet for Trump and the Trump Organization, and go back to Rikers Island. This Judge and Goron uh, hearing, you know, that's going to happen that you just talked about. You know, what 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 I thought was interesting is that Judge and Goron and the Attorney General's office allowed the Manhattan DA's office to do this to handle the perjury and not them. They they really just sort of deferred to them because you know, on the one hand when you look at the fact that he committed perjury and he suborned perjury on the stand, you know, there's a couple things to consider. It's not just Alina Haba and Chris Kais who I think knew that he changed his testimony, right? I mean, the the um, attorney general's office did too, right? They knew when he was testifying that he testified differently. So, you know, it, it's just the, que the question is, um, you know, it, it, it happened in that courtroom and, but they allowed the Manhattan DA's office to just deal with it. And I think again, with Judge Angoran, that he just wants to keep his eye on the ball, which is Trump and the Trump case and, and this hearing that's coming up that we're going to be, uh, that we're going to be having. Yeah, so we'll follow it. You'll follow it with Ben. I'll follow it. Um, and we'll do it on the Midas Touch Network, where I think people have come to trust that we don't blow smoke or sunshine. We try to give you our experience from operating in the courtrooms that we talk about. Karen and I practice primarily in New York. Um, we both have national trial practices. Um, and, you know, listen, we do it through that lens. Me primarily as a defense lawyer and, of course, Karen. Freeman Ignifolo served a long time, almost 30 years, in the Manhattan DA's office. It was the very prosecuting agency that's putting on the trial. So who better to hear from? Welcome back. That was Legal AF. We sit at the intersection of law and politics, so you don't have to. And we curate, uh, you know, to get behind the headlines, the top five stories or developments at that intersection of law and politics. We do it on Wednesdays. We do it on Saturdays, right here on the Midas Touch Network, on Legal AF at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Join the show. You'll find out why we call it Legal AF. It's exactly what you think. And then we do um, hot takes like this one about every, about every hour on the Midas Touch Network. And then we put our show on audio podcast platforms. You may already know about the show. And if you do, we really appreciate you being a part of our audience. Take that clip. Help be our marketing department. We need it. Send it off to friends and family and people in your life and say, hey, you know that show Legal AF? Um, here's an example of it. Maybe they'll join our audience. Um, and until the next time we get together, my next podcast, my next Legal AF, my next hot take, this is Michael Popak reporting. Heary, heary, Legal AF Law Breakdown is now in session. Go beyond the headlines and get a deep dive into the important legal concepts you need to know and we discuss every day on Legal AF. Exclusive content you won't find anywhere else, all for the price of a couple of cups of coffee. Join us at patreon.com slash legal AF. That's patreon.com slash legal AF.